Hello and welcome to Sparda Light, your one-stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examinations. Today we have picked up a couple of important articles from the examination point of view. Let's get started and look into the first article. Before we look into what these articles are, we've also picked up MCQs for the same. For every article we will be discussing, we've also taken MCQs as well. What is that you have to do? You have to first look at the question, answer the question in the comment section and then look at the explanation. If you're liking these initiatives, please do like these initiatives and also hit on the subscribe button. Let's look into the first question. The Medicada barrage is part of which of the following irrigation projects? Anai Muduvu medium irrigation project, Kaleshwaram project, Mayurakshi project, Polavaram project. The Medigadda barrage is part of which among the following irrigation projects? The answer to this is Kaleshwaram project. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to Medigadda project. We have two articles on the Hindu. One is with respect to Krishna Reddy says he can get CBI to probe Medigadda project. The other is about mudding the waters. Both these articles are speaking about the Medigadda barrage. Whereas this Medigadda barrage, this happens to be a project that was initiated as part of the Kaleshwaram project. This Kaleshwaram project is initiated on the Godavari river. So remember, we have the Medigadda project that is taken place on the Kaleshwaram project. And this is also known as the Lakshmi barrage. This happens to be the starting point of the proposed Kaleshwaram project, which envisages construction of three barrages between Ellampalli and Medigadda. The barrage or the project site is located at Medigadda village, which is why it is called as a Medigadda barrage. Mahadevpur Mandal, Jayashankar Bhupalpalli district in the state of Telangana. And this river is where this project is constructed. That is, we have the Godavari river. On the Godavari river, what we have is the Kaleshwaram project. Why are we discussing about it? That is because this barrage recently sank into the Godavari river last month. The incident resulted in sinking of six pillars from the 15th to the 20th and the probable weakening of the gates at the 6th, 7th and 8th blocks. And as a result, this project has become gone for a toss and we have to reconstruct this entire project. So the extent of the damage basically means that the whole barrage may have to be rebuilt in this particular place. That is why we have taken up this particle. So remember, the Kaleshwaram project is an irrigation project. It also needs to, it will also provide drinking water facilities to the people in the state of Telangana. And this also has Medikadda project, which is part of the Kaleshwaram project. This happens to be the first article. Let's look into the second practice question. Mubarak Manzil Palace is in the state of, is it in Goa, Himachal Pradesh, Maharashtra or Punjab? The answer to this is Punjab. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a representation or a reference to the Mubarak Manzil. Whereas this Mubarak Manzil Palace, this happens to be a palace which is present in Malarkotla town of Punjab. So whenever you have a question, where is this Mubarak Manzil Palace? Remember, this Mubarak Manzil Palace happens to be in the state of Punjab. Malarkotla's significance has its own share of importance to the Sikh history. What is it? Malarkotla's significance in the history has been immense as people, especially Sikhs, revered Sher Muhammad Khan, who happens to be the former Nawab of Malarkotla, who raised his voice of protest against the execution of the sons of Guru Gobind Singh. So, because he stood up against the execution of Guru Gobind Singh's son, that is why the Sikhs revered the Singh. That is why the Sikhs, these people from the Sikh community, they happen to revere that is King Sher Muhammad Khan. And now this particular palace is in a very bad state, is in a sordid state and as a result, all that they are seeking is for the restoration of this architectural beauty so that it can be remembered by the future generation. But the point of importance for us is that Mubarak Manzil Palace is in the state of Punjab, where in Malarkotla town. Now let's look into the next practice question. Bulawa, an intercontinental ballistic missile, was developed by which among the following countries? Iran, Israel, 
North Korea or Russia? The answer to this is Russia. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu once again makes a reference to the Bulava. Bulava happens to be one of the missiles that was designed by the Russian Navy. With this, what we have is the nuclear triad that comes into the picture. What is a nuclear triad? If the nuclear missiles can be launched by an aircraft via air or it can be launched on the land you making use of the ballistic missile or it can be launched on the sea making use of the what is called as the submarines in that case that country would have fulfilled the criteria of nuclear triad and with Bulawa what we have is a submarine where this can be launched via a submarine and as a result this fulfills the nuclear triad. So remember Bulawa happens to be a submarine launched ballistic missile that was developed by the Russian Navy. So Russia test fires nuclear capable ballistic missile from the submarine and that nuclear capable ballistic missile happens to be Bulawa. So it was developed by which country? It was developed by Russia. This happens to be another important MCQ from your preliminary examination point of view. Now let's look into the next article. This article here makes a reference to one of the fires that had taken place in Greece. We have one of the national park called as the Dadia Levkimi Soli Forest National Park. Where is it? It is in the country of Greece. This can be very very important from the preliminary examination point of view. So they may ask you a question that recently Dadia Levkimi Soli Forest National Park was in use. It is part of which country? So remember it is part of Greece. It is an ideal habitat for the birds of praise and cultures and the part and the park hosts three of the Europe's four vulture species which includes Cinerus vulture, Egyptian vulture, a globally endangered species and the Griffon vulture. The park also hosts 30 to 35 Cinerus vulture pairs. It is home to the last remaining breeding population of the species in the Balkans. Several threats such as poisoning wiped out colonies in all other Balkan regions during the 20th century and recently what we had was forest fires or the Datla fires in the country of Greece. This has resulted in massive fires across Europe and this is being recorded as the largest in the Europe's recorded history. So because it happens to be the Europe's largest fire, this can be probable question for your preliminary examination. We didn't make an MCQ for this but this is very very important and can be possibly asked in your preliminary examination. So Dadia Lefkimi Southly Forest National Park is in the country of Greece in Europe and it recently witnessed forest fires and this happens to be the largest in the Europe's recorded history. Now let's look into the next article. This article once again is important from the preliminary examination point of view. When we speak about mosquitoes, mosquitoes are the host or they are the vectors of number of diseases. If we speak about chikungunya or let's say for example malaria or for example dengue, these are the diseases that are spread by the mosquito. Mosquito happens to be the vector which carries all these diseases which ultimately harm the human beings. We would have taken care of the mosquitoes for which what we also have is the insecticides. So we have come up with number of insecticides as well but despite coming up with these insecticides what these mosquitoes have become is prone or immune to these insecticides and they are not being impacted by these insecticides. So what we required was a new initiative that we had to do and one such initiative that we have taken to reduce the population of the mosquitoes is what is called as Wolbachia. So this whenever you listen to this word Wolbachia remember it is a mechanism where we are planning to reduce the population of the female mosquitoes by making use of a technique called as Wolbachia. So what is Wolbachia? Wolbachia bacteria are not found in a Aegis mosquitoes. Scientists introduced Wolbachia into Aegis mosquitoes. When male mosquitoes with Wolbachia mate with female mosquitoes that do not have Wolbachia, the eggs will not hatch. So what are we trying to do? We have the male mosquitoes and we also have the female mosquitoes. Only the female mosquitoes bite. They need a blood meal to produce the eggs 
main mosquitoes do not bite they feed on nectars from the flowers so what do they do we introduce this bacteria into the male in such a way that they when they get into that relationship with the female mosquitoes these female mosquitoes mate with the male mosquitoes and ultimately because of this bacteria that has been introduced into the male mosquitoes the female eggs will not hatch so male mosquitoes with wolbachia are released regularly into an area by mosquito control professionals male mosquitoes with wolbachia mate with female mosquitoes and because the eggs don't hatch the number of female mosquitoes decreases over a period of time so basically introducing this bacteria that is wolbachia into the males whereby when the male mates with the female these females will not mate and that is these females will not lay eggs ultimately the female population will also take control of it so whenever the bacteria is being introduced what will they do they selectively pick up the male bacteria male mosquitoes introduce bacteria into it and ultimately they will keep a check on the female population that is what is this wolbachia so wolbachia happens to be a genus of bacteria that has evolved complex relationship with many insects insects and making use of it what they do is that they'll reduce the female population count of the mosquitoes it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says a leaf out of the new zealand's oating system what is this article speaking about the article is important from the polity point of view where we are speaking about the oating system when we speak about the oating system there are different kinds of oating system proportional representation then we also have what is called as the first past the post system so what is this split oating system new zealand has something called as a split oating system which basically means they will have the first past the oat system as well as the proportional representation let me explain this with the help of an example so what is this first past the post system when we speak about the first past the post system what exactly happens we have the first past the post system according to the first past the post system we will have is a constituency let's say for example we have a lok sabha constituency or a legislative assembly constituency so there will be a boundary that will be demarcated on the basis of the population so once a boundary is demarcated what would happen there will be political parties for example in india let's say for example we have the bjp we have the congress we have the jdu we have the shivsena so on and so forth these political parties will name one of its political candidates for that particular constituency let's say for example we are taking delhi De delhi central in this particular case what we have is three major political parties bjp congress as well as aap so all the three candidates will fight for that particular constituency who will win that particular constituency and who will have the seat of that particular constituency will ultimately depend who will get the maximum number of votes let's say for example in a constituency hypothetical example there are about 100 votes 100 votes there are people who go and vote out of 100 if any person who's got maximum number of votes which means let's say there are three political parties which are contesting let's say each of the political party gets 33 33 votes but if there is another person who's got 34 votes so irrespective of how many votes that person has got even if the majority is by one vote that person will go on to retain that particular position so what happens in the first past the post system in the first past the post system whosoever has recorded the majority from that particular constituency the numbers and the gravity and the magnitude will not matter even if it is by one single vote if the person has won the election that person will retain the seat in that particular constituency so he will go on to become the mla or an mp from that constituency so it means in the first past the post system whosoever wins the majority even if it is by one single vote that person will go on to become an mla or an mp that is what is first past the post system what happens in proportional system in proportional representation or the proportional system as we see in israel israel is an example of the proportional representation system what exactly happens in that you have number of political parties which will be cont uh, contesting let's say for example there is a political party a let's say for example there is a political party b or a political party c so the candidates will stand but in this particular case it is the 
political party that you vote for. Let's say you vote for a political party B, A, B, C, so on and so forth. So A political party has got about 40% of the vote. B political party has got about 30% of the vote. And C has got about 30% of the vote. So in this particular case, let's say for example, there are about 100 seats in the parliament. Out of 100, 40 seats will go for political party A. 30 seats will go for political party B and 30 seats will go for political party C. So on the basis of the overall vote share, let's say 40% vote share, 30% vote share, 20% vote share, 10% vote share, on the basis of the vote share that they have got, what they will have is the representation in the parliament. In the first past the post system, you will have the political candidates who will be there in that particular constituency. Even if they win by one vote, they will become the members of the parliament or the members of the state legislative assembly in proportional system. A party is selected vote share on the basis of the vote share, whether it is 40%, 30%, 20%, 10%, on the basis of 10%. If they've got 10%, 10 seats will be allocated to that political party. If it is 20% of the share, 20 seats will be allocated to that particular political party. So it is not the first past the post in proportional system. system. On the basis of the vote share, the amount of representatives or the number of representatives will be on the basis of the vote share. But what happens in New Zealand? In New Zealand, what we have is a split system. In split system, what we also have is the first past the post system, as well as what we also have is a proportional system, which is why it is called as the MMP system, which basically means what we have is the mixed member proportional representation system. So in the mixed member proportional represent system, what we have to look is the numbers. When we look at New Zealand, let's say for example, in New Zealand, we have 120 seats in the parliament. This 120 seats will be split. Split in terms of what? 72 seats will be for the representation where you will have the political candidates representing that party similar to the first past the post system the leftover that is out of 72 whatever is left over out of 120 that will be in the form of a party vote so first what we will have is a electoral vote and next following it what we have is a called as the party vote in 72 what we will have is the first past the post system which basically means what we will have is the candidates who will be contesting in that particular constituency on the basis of whoever wins that particular constituency by the majority that person will be selected as an MP out of which out of this 72 you also have to remember that there are about uh, let's say for example there is a specific community called as the Kiora community uh, there is a specific community called as Mayori community this Maori community happens to be a tribal group, a certain amount of votes, let's say for example, about 7 out of 72, 7 will be reserved for this tribal community. Who are these tribal community people? They are the indigenous community people. Out of 72, 7 will be reserved for this, which means 65 will be for the general ones and 7 would be for this Maori, which means they are the ones who are the indigenous community. Only those people would be able to stand for these elections. So out of 72, 65 would be for the general. Anyone can contest the elections. 7 will be only for the Maori community. These are the tribal indigenous groups. Only they can contest. So this happens to be the first past the post system. So what we will have is the electoral districts. So the electoral districts once again will be designed on the basis of a fixed boundary on the basis of the population. So political parties will have their representatives fight in this particular constituency whosoever gets the majority they will go on to win the elections and at the same time the rest out of 120 what we will have is called as the party vote what happens in the party vote in the party vote what you will have is the representatives political parties will get the vote so every can let's say for example i am the person who will be voting in new zealand so what would happen i would be given two lists so i would be given two votes one is where I have to vote according to the electoral vote, which means to say I would be able to select the political party candidate for the political party. So here I am selecting a candidate who will win on the basis of the first part.
past the post system. Apart from this oath that I have, which is called as the electoral oath, what I will also have is a party oath. So according to the party oath, I would also be able to oath for a political party. So at the end of it, you will have 72 oaths, which is different. The remaining oaths, which will be different. And the remaining oaths that is left over, it is calculated on the basis of a party vote. How does it work? It depends on the proportional system, which means that if a political party out of the remaining 120, that is 72 is taken out, the remaining oaths whatsoever is present, you will have the percentage that will be calculated and on the basis of the calculation, let's say a political party has got 20%, it will get 20% of the seats. If it has got 40% in the party vote, then 40% will go to that political party, 30% has been garnered by another political party, that 30% will be reserved for that political party so what we have is a split system one where we have the first past the post system what we will also have is the proportional representation in the form of a party vote so how does new zealand work so when it comes to new zealand you vote for political what party you want to represent so when you vote for a party you help to choose how many seats in parliament each party gets so i will have is a party vote so on the basis of proportional representation whether it is 10 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent whatsoever it is i will be allowed to select one political party in a oath. So when I select that oath, that political party will have so much representation on the basis of the percentage that is proportional representation. And then you vote for the candidate you want to represent the area. So when you vote for a candidate, you help to choose who represents the electorate you live in. And pol basically political parties must also get at least 5% of the party vote. So when we speak about the party vote, they should minimum get 5% or win an electorate seat before they can have any seats in the parliament and also remember this is what is called as the MMP system or which is called as the mixed member proportional system because it has both these aspects one is a first past the post system the other also happens to be the proportional representation since both are present you will have the minorities who will also have the voice in case they have about five percent six percent of the oath share if it is the first past the post system they will have no representation whatsoever but now that they've got about six percent about six percent of the seats in the party share we Will be allocated to these people when it comes to the representation that is how this system basically works so the author in this particular case goes on to say that this has its own share of merits what are those the first benefit is the split voting system allows for more localized accountability for the elected representatives they can't just ride on a party wave the second is the policy focus where ideologies would be able to garner the party votes it is not just about the political candidate who is contesting but it is all also about the party which is contesting the ideology of that particular party where it depends on what kind of ideology that the political party has if the political party has an ideology and if people are respecting that ideology on the basis of the party oath they will still be able to win the elections the third is that MMP improves representation for women indigenous communities differently able people and other deprived groups let's say for example in the party oath what would happen there would be a ranking system let's say for example there would there are about 30 seats in the party hypothetical example so out of it if it is the first seat that is one so and so person will be selected so with the election commission of new zealand they would already would have given the names of the people if we get one seat this seat will be taken over by the women if it is the second seat it will be taken over by the differently able people so even before the elections have concluded so it is already pre-decided that if we get one seat it will be this person who will be selected if it is the second seat it will be so and so person would be selected so a ranking would have been given already first second third fourth so on and so forth up until 30 so if the number of seats exponentially increase the 30th person will get the seat if there are only five seats 
the first five people whose list is already being given to the election commission those people's names would be given and they become the mp so you also have representation of different section of the people mmp enhances democracy by letting voters express a diverse range of political preferences so you would want that particular candidate to win in that local constituency so you vote for the first past the post but you also want another political party to have an imprint at the national level so you can vote for a party as well as the candidate but here in india if you are looking into it what can you vote for you can vote either for that particular person or for a political party let's say you like bjp or you like congress but you do not like the candidate who is from a different political party but you are supposed to vote only for that particular person despite you liking a particular political party but in there if you like a political candidate you can vote for that particular candidate but if you like a party as well you can also vote for the party so there are two ways of you addressing your concerns fifth the system provides flexibility allowing voters to select the best political candidate with a combination of the party beliefs as well sixth after the introduction of the mmp the average age of an mp in new zealand has considerably declined it was 47.3 years in 2020 elections this has been possibly because of the low entry barrier for young politicians thanks to the split voting system so that is how the split voting system works so can it also be adapted in india where we have massive number of people who are selecting only on the first past the post system if we can introduce the split concept where we will also have proportional representation other sections of the people's voice will also be heard is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says giving the urban indian a better life the article here is speaking about the world cities day it is also taking into picture that there are various issues that are present in the urban areas and these areas will have to be addressed one such area that the article focuses is on the pollution front first we will understand what is this world cities day then we will also look at how increase in the urbanization and massive urbanization has created a concrete jungle which has increased the pollution exponentially first what is this world cities day the united nations general assembly designated 31 october as world cities day by its resolution of 68 is to 239 which means that on 31st of october every year what we will have is the world cities day that will be observed so what is this world cities day what we have is the exponential rise of the cities and the urban areas the urban areas what it says is that it has to increase it provides livelihood to number of people as well while we are increasing the urbanization in every country a focus will also have to be laid on the basis of sustainability as well increasing pollution concrete jungle and then there is no sustainability factor into picture so as much as we are increasing the urbanization and we are also increasing the livelihood provisions in the urbanization there are other areas which we have to focus focusing on the pollution part as well that is what is the world city state so as much as we are increasing the urbanization increasing the cities concentrating and providing livelihood means and resources why not also look at the troubles that are facing the urbanization that is increasing heat which is also called as the urban heat island then there is pollution as well and because of the pollution when people inhale the toxic gases their lifespan will also reduce and for them to commute from one place to another it is taking a lot of time as well that is because of the traffic and the congestion that is reported in number of cities so how do we overcome this particular issue is what this article is so the world city day basically says that the day is expected to greatly promote international communities interest in global urbanization push forward cooperation among countries in meeting opportunities addressing challenges of urbanization contributing to sustainable urban development urbanization provides for potential for new forms of social inclusion greater equality access to service and new opportunities and engagement sustainable developmental goal 11 which formulates the ambition to make cities and human settlements inclusive safe resilient sustainable underlying the relevance of the un habitat mission and the theme for the year 2023 focuses on financing sustainable urban future for all to explore how to unlock transformative investment in urban planning and achieve adequate fiscal decentralization so basically it is focusing on the finances so when we speak about the urban areas one of the major problematic areas on the urban level is the municipalities which are not able to spend on the urban 
urban levels primarily because they lack the finances they do not have the money at their disposal since they do not have the money at their disposal they do not have the finances they do not have money at their hands how will they bring a change at the local level how will they bring the change at the ward level for which what we have to do is enhance the finances and the money and the amount of disposal that they have so the focus is on augmenting increasing enhancing the finances so that if they have the money they would be able to come out with the solution for the problems in the city is the theme for the year 2023 so this article primarily goes on to say that what we are witnessing in urban india is massive pollution so because of the pollution the inhalation of these toxic gases has reduced the period of the people which means for an average if you consider that people are able to live for about 70 years or 60 years so on and so forth because of the toxic gases that they inhale their life expectancy is also being reduced by about 5.3 years and when it comes to Delhi this has reduced the life expectancy by 11.9 years and Delhi as Supreme Court has said it has become a toxic gas chamber as well a report released by the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago shows that out of 50 most polluted cities in the world 39 are in India pollution directly affects the health of the people and an average Indian loses 5.3 years of his life expectancy due to this and for the residents of Delhi it is 11.9 years this data not only highlights the need for policy shifts to ensure better and livable futures and if you look into the data a media report labeled air pollution in Mumbai as death by breath due to very unsatisfactory air quality index level and bad air is not just limited to the indo gangetic plains but this has also led to other Indian coastal cities also being impacted as well so the article goes on to say that because of excessive pollution this has resulted in burning eyes irritation of the nose and the throat coughing choked breath asthma apart from causing cardiovascular diseases why is this happening that is because our focus is not on the sustainability but our focus is just on increasing the adaptability and increasing the urban areas providing people the urban areas widening the roads as well we have become so polished in our thinking that we only think that a civil urban society is where you will have huge buildings you will have as a concrete jungles you have to fell off the trees and ultimately you have to create the buildings and at one point of time you should have more number of carts on the road this is not the urbanization so the article goes on to say that because of the constant increase of the number of vehicles on the road increase of the number of buildings we are not paying heat to other areas and as a result number of places let's say for example you have a water body or let's say for example there is a plant as well there is a plant region the, for example, if you take the Bengaluru, you have something called as Guntopus. What are these Guntopus? These are the green areas. These Guntopus are now real estate agents. These Guntopus have now become under the control of the real estate mafia. They ideally have to be under the control of the government. But then you have the lake pits that are taken over. These small mini forests called as Guntopus which are taken over by the real estate mafia. The original intent is being constantly changed as well. So the green lungs of the cities, the water bodies, the urban forest, the green cover are now under the kitty of the real estate mafia and then because of the change and the expansion of the construction activity this has led to massive concrete jungle added to it what we have is increase in the automobile sector so the india's automobile market has risen in value by 100 billion and is expected to touch 160 billion by 2027 registering a growth of 8.1 percent between july 2023 to september 2023 passenger and commercial vehicle sales have touched 13 lakhs 22,818 units so construction activity lack of the transport of the government side public transport and then capture and acquisition of these areas like the mini forest by these people have led to the major problems at the urban level so what is that we have to do the article goes on to say that we have to bring couple of changes what are these changes one we have to bring new design and the direction for the urban development we basically until now have believed in the urbanization means widening the roads more widening of the roads which basically means more cars this has to reduce how do we reduce it we have to 
to bring new design and the thinking as well as of now what we have is a top down approach so you have people who will from the ivory towers they basically believe that this is the plan that we have to implement people's recommendation people's viewpoints people's inputs are not even taken into picture so instead of the top down approach what we require is the bottom up approach where people the citizens are actively participant into it we have to focus on the public transport rather than only going by the cars and the vehicles as well form initiatives that emulate the jawaharlal nehru national urban renew program and public transport must be enhanced constructive activities let's say for example there's construction that are taking place in couple of cities they need to have a standard operating procedure or this is what we call as a sops so whenever there is a construction what measures have to be taken by that particular company or that by that particular agent will have to be put into place apart from that we also can come up with alternatives like congestion tax what is this congestion tax this was a proposal that was made by the karnataka government recently this congestion tax basically says that whenever there is a peak traffic when is the peak traffic let's say for example 9 am in the morning up until 11 am in the morning so during this particular period instead of using the public transport if people are using the private transport they will have to pay some taxes so what is the government encouraging the government is asking them to leave away their private vehicles instead travel by the public transport use the government buses use the metro use the railway so at that particular moment between 9 to 11 am or evening between 5 pm to 7 pm if you are using your vehicles you have to pay certain taxes called as the congestion tax because there are a lot number and density of vehicles are more in this particular area so the alternative could be impose the congestion tax we can make use of the odd number or even number or plate formula what do we understand by this you have your car number let's say for example your car number is K A zero one A H zero 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 one and your next car number is zero 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 two. So for one day, what you can make use of is a car which has an odd number and even number vehicles. If they come on that particular day, they will be imposed with fine. And for the next subsequent day, you can make use of a car or a bike which has an even number, which basically means that day you cannot use an odd number of vehicle. with this what you will have is less number of vehicles on the road but this also has an exception let's say for example garment vehicles ambulances they will be exempted from this odd and the even number formula a no car day on certain days can also be taken up elite as well as state chief ministers can set an example by using the public transport we can make use of the graded response action plan similar to how it is in delhi so if it breaches a particular numbers when it comes to the air quality index some actions will have to be initiated zero active acceptance of industrial pollution and real time monitoring these industrial companies may not be following the rules that have been established on the standard operating procedure so what we require is an institution one such institution which will constantly monitor if they are following the rules and the regulations envisaged by the law if they are not doing it then penal provisions will also have to be imposed by this institution urban commons like the ponds water bodies urban forest parks playgrounds are another major area that should not at all be allowed to be taken over by either public or the private bodies this should be under the control of the government and ultimately they should make sure that there is no acquisition of these areas then massive land use changes this should not be promoted we should plant more trees we should not fell trees or cut on the trees these smoke towers and even watering roads are just cosmetic but the real method is what we require is a pollution guide and the standard operating standard operating procedures for various line departments as well as agencies so there are number of ministries as well as line departments as well for them what we have to give is a standard operating procedure which they have to follow is what is this article all about in a link to this we have another editorial this is with respect to what is happening in delhi so a toxic has persists over new delhi for the sixth consecutive day obscuring landmarks as well and this is because of the pollution so this article says we have to take up measures and those measures we have just discussed so these two articles together are about the pollution now let's look into the next article this article says a head of financial action task force review center takes measures to implement suggestions 
when we speak about the Financial Action Task Force, it happens to be an international body which basically looks at money laundering issues. In case there are countries which have lacuna, lacuna when it comes to the money laundering steps that they have to take, they will issue recommendations and these recommendations will have to be ultimately uphold and will have to be implemented by countries. And as part of the Financial Action Task Force, there are two types of designations that the Financial Action Task Force gives. One is called as the grey list, the other is what is called as the blacklist. What is this blacklist? A blacklist happens to be a country which is placed in this particular schedule or the list where despite the financial action task force telling them that you have to follow so and so steps in order to eliminate money laundering, these countries would not have taken any measures whatsoever. For example, you have countries like North Korea. North Korea is one example. Which are the other examples of the blacklist countries of the financial action task force is what you have to put on the comment section. So the one example that we have taken is North Korea. So financial action task force would have said please take these many measures so that we are able to see what is happening with respect to the money laundering issues so on and so forth. But despite repeated calls these countries would not have taken any steps and as a result they are in the blacklist. What is a grey list country? A grey list country is the financial action task force would have recommended certain operations or certain methods or certain ways as to which they would be able to cut down on the money laundering issues. They would have taken only few steps but majority of the steps they would not have taken and as a result to monitor them they would have been placed under the grey list. In blacklist no measures would be taken. In grey list some measures will be taken. Most measures will be not taken and they will be under the watchful eyes of the financial action task force. Pakistan keeps wagering and keeps vaccinating between the grey list, they will be added to the grey list, they will be taken out of the grey list and one such country that we have is Pakistan which always is in grey list and will be removed as well. Which are the countries which you feel are in grey list, please put it on the comment section. So similarly, there are other countries which would have implemented most of the recommendations given by the financial action task force which are not present in the black list and the grey list. But there are few which there might be missing. So the financial action task force would have asked these countries to follow certain measures. So India has said that it will follow these recommendations. So some of the recommendations include ahead of India's mutual evaluations by the financial action task force, the union government has taken several measures to implement intergovernmental bodies recommendation made following the 2010 review which includes notification of practicing chartered accountants, company secretaries and cost and management accounts as reporting entities. So all these will have to be taken up by the Indian government says this article and the Indian government is likely to bring changes to these sectors is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says leave benefits for women in the armed forces made uniform. So the Defence Minister Rajnath Singh has approved a proposal to grant maternity, child care and child adoption leave to women, soldiers, sailors as the sea air warriors on par with the officers. So until now it was given to the officers, now it is also being granted to the soldiers, sailors and the air warriors. And this will make it all inclusive participation. So basically women officers get maternity leave of 180 days with full pay to a maximum of two children. Child care leave of 360 days is granted in total service career to women officers. Child adoption leave of 180 days is granted after the date of valid adoption of a child below one year of age. So this will be extended to the women soldiers. Apart from the officers, it will now be extended to the women soldiers is what is this article all about. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. If you are liking these initiatives, please do like these videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel and also share it with your other aspirants as well. Thank you for watching. All the best.